If you're anything like me, you're fantastically interested by scientific discovery, but part of the reason why you like it is because those discoveries can go on to actually generate impact, generate benefits for society, produce something that is good for the world. Now, you might think that the best way to produce that impact is to go away and write a paper, but it turns out that having a PDF sit in someone's folder actually isn't really that useful. What is more useful is to take those ideas that you come up with within the research lab, to pick them up and to move them out into the world yourself. In this video, I wanna explore the top three reasons why I think scientists make unbelievably good entrepreneurs. Point number one is the ability to spot opportunities that no one else has ever spotted before. Science is only good, it turns out, at least according to publishers, if it's new, if no one's ever seen it before, gone are the days where it was interesting as a scientist to repeat other people's experiments and show that they did in fact work. When I was working as a scientist, a lot of the conversations that we had involved understanding and spotting other potential opportunities for experiments that we could try in the future. Ultimately, what we wanted to do was to do scientific work that our peers would judge to be good enough, to be interesting, so that we could generate papers, obviously number one, but also so that people just recognized the work that we were doing and potentially wanted to collaborate with us. To us, what we were looking for were opportunities that were a good balance of difficult science that was unique and hadn't been done before, but equally created some return on that hard work, return on that investment that we were putting in to get the work actually done. Good opportunities are exactly what entrepreneurs spend their time looking for. The metrics are different. They may be looking for economic returns, financial implications. However, the kind of process of going through that opportunity assessment and triaging is something that absolutely is a common trait between entrepreneurs and scientists. And actually, if you think about it, that's reasonably rare in terms of a job description. Most people kind of do it once. They say, what do I wanna be? I wanna be an artist. They see that opportunity and they go for it. Or they wanna go into accounting. Maybe they don't say that too often, but some people must want to go into accounting. Now there might be smaller kind of opportunities on a day-by-day -day basis. The opportunity to impress their boss, the opportunity to make a jump forward, uh, up the kind of career ladder or make a good impression with a potential client. But the very nature of the job is not to look for opportunities. But in science and in entrepreneurship, it is. Point number two is that scientists are naturally very good funding finders. I thought, I guess mistakenly, uh, that when you went out and you tried to get a job as a scientist, particularly within kind of the academic arena, that if you were successful in getting that job, the university would be paying your way uh, and that the university would also be paying for you to do some research. It turns out that is not the case. Typically what happens is that you win some funding, usually it's in the form of a grant by applying, by, se by selling a really exciting idea that you're looking for some grant funding to deliver. Then you take that grant funding, usually in the form of a fellowship, and you'll apply to different universities to say which university will have me. And you know what? That kind of sounds suspiciously like entrepreneurship, like someone having to go out and try and secure some investment to get their idea started. Although as a scientist, you write down your research ideas in the form of a grant and submit them to some grant body. As an entrepreneur, you write your ideas down in the form of a business plan, and then you shop that business plan around different investors until you find some kind of resonance. I would actually even argue that it's easier to be an entrepreneur because there are just so many different opportunities for funding. You can turn to grants to get your idea off the ground, but equally you can turn to private investment, you can turn maybe depending on the business to something like a bank loan. As a bonus point, point 2.5, you could also argue that as a master's student or PhD, also reasonably well versed at surviving on quite a limited budget. Uh, which is a keen skill as an entrepreneur. The ramen diet absolutely is a real part of the first phase of most people's entrepreneurial journey. Uh, you've just lived that for four years as a PhD student. So well done, you're more than ready to jump into entrepreneurship. Point three is the idea of embracing risk and maybe also mitigating it to a certain extent. One of the cornerstones of entrepreneurship is embracing risk, doing something inherently that is risky, but with potential big upside if it does all kind of pan out right. Equally within science, most people don't do science and repeat other people's experiments. Most people go out to carve a pathway that has not been explored before and that no one on the planet has ever worked on. 
that is the definition of a risky career trajectory because the science you're trying to do just might not work. Both entrepreneurs and scientists in their day-to-day -day work try and mitigate that risk. If you've sat for kind of any period of time in the startup world, you've probably heard of a book called The Lean Startup. I think I have one. You've probably heard of a book called The Lean Startup, uh, which again, kind of is a cornerstone of entrepreneurship. It's a great book. Basically, it, the point of it boils down to if you do business more like a scientist, if you test ideas rather than crossing your fingers and hoping for success, you actually have a higher probability of that company coming out good. That's not exactly how the book phrases it, but it is kind of the point that it boils down to. The idea basically being test your assumptions, go out and find meaningful ways to test your assumptions in a way that is cheap, in a way that is time efficient so that you can understand if you're kind of on the right track before you start putting major resources behind something. What we used to do in the lab when I was working was what we referred to as quick and dirty experiments, which sound maybe more exciting than they actually are. Well being do something as quickly and as cheaply as possible in order to prove that a later, more expensive, more difficult to set up, more time consuming experiment would actually probably, hopefully, fingers crossed, work. This has been a cornerstone of poorly funded scientists for a long, long, long time. This is something that the business world started taking seriously in what, 20, 2011. There's a huge argument for a better use of human capability, better use of human capital, by making sure that scientists understand that if they do find discoveries within the lab, they can take those ideas and move them into the world themselves. It is much easier to take someone who is a world expert in quantum mechanics or synthetic biology or chemistry or nanophysics or anything scientific in discipline and teach them enough about business where they can get started than it is to take someone that has 35 years of business experience and teach them enough about quantum mechanics or synthetic biology, anything I just mentioned, so that they can actually spot something new and novel there and then start a company. If you like this video and you are interested in seeing some of the videos that I've made detailing some scientists doing exactly that, taking their ideas out of the lab and moving them into the world, then check out this playlist that I've put hopefully here. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.